Okay. Returning the disciples' prayer. You have the easiest Sunday school class in the world to follow. I hope you appreciate what I do for you in that special thing. Because we only cover a few words a week. Just a few words. I don't pound you with just huge passages. We're lucky to get through three or four words. So when you're done, you at least understand. You may be bored to death, but you understand those words. And we've been doing that each week. So what I'd like to start with today is let's read the whole thing through. We've been dealing with the disciples' prayer, doing it in sections. So let's get the big picture once again as we start. This is Jesus starting in chapter 6 in Matthew. And he starts talking about prayer here in verse 5. And he says this, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by them. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close your door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen, and then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. And here it is. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Some of the most familiar words in the English language. Some of the most commonly practiced and recited of all passages of scripture and we are trying to find out what is really the content here because remember Jesus did not give us this prayer to recite it is not that you can't recite it but understand his whole point was to get away from the practice of saying the same words over and over to the point they become meaningless and have no purpose in life We've been doing just a few words a week. The reason for this is simply this. This section here is not a prayer in and of itself. It is an outline for prayer. Each of these sections, the ones we went through, our Father in heaven, or hallowed be thy name, and the one we're going to do today, your kingdom come. Each of those is an outline point, if you will. It's a heading or a category that prayer should contain. So what we've been doing is going through those outline points, stopping with each phrase, and then deep diving into what it means. What is Jesus telling us should be the content of prayer? What is the purpose of prayer? What are we pursuing in prayer? Why do we pray? All of those things are contained here, and we're trying to understand it. If you remember, we said that the two point or two pillars that support the effective Christian life. I'm going to ask you again. You didn't get it right last week, so it's pop quiz again. <laughs> what are the two things, the two pillars that support the credible, the effective Christian life? Prayer and study. Prayer and study. Those are the two things that make it work. Prayer is talking to God. Study is God talking to us. Understand it. To get God to speak to you, to have God speak to your life and what you need to do. Do not go outside and wait for a shaft of light from heaven. Do not wait for a booming voice from the clouds. Do not have to have some spiritual experience where you receive the Spirit and suddenly God is speaking to you. I remember the one guy that said he met God every morning when he shaved. Jesus was standing in his mirror speaking to him. <laughs> I'm sorry. No. That is not what is laid out here. God has laid out his mind. Do you understand what it's like to delve into scripture? You're going into the mind of God. There's a place to hang out. If you want to have fun anywhere, let's go into the mind of God and see how he thinks. How does he view things? How does he want us to think? What has he laid out about life? This is what we find in scripture. And then when we come back to prayer, which is conversation with God, understand it's meant to be a relationship, not ritual. We now have a mindset that opens up to us what God is saying and allows us to be a focus now on the mind of God, the thinking of God. And when you are in the mind of God, guess what that does to your decision process in life? 
you now come to that time when you have to, what would God have me do? Remember the thing people have worked for a long time? What would Jesus do? You know where you find that? Right here. Because Jesus did it, and if you read it, you know what Jesus would do. That's the point of studying here. <coughs> Study and prayer. How vital is this? Why is he going through this? Because we said it almost seems ridiculous that Jesus is teaching this group of people how to pray. Because who's he talking to here? The disciples, the Jews at large. He is surrounded by his group of disciples. He's surrounded now by a huge crowd, including religious leaders, temple priests, all kinds of people there. Are, this is the most religious people on the planet. This is the most praying people on the planet. And he addresses them with this saying and says, you have no idea how to pray. That had to come as a shock. Now, I've given you an illustration, I think, to let. Why is prayer so important? This is the breathing of the Christian. Prayer is breathing. I think that is the best illustration you can come up with. How vital is breathing to you daily? Yeah, no big deal. No, it's kind of important, don't you think? Don't you think? And how often do you do it? All day long. Learning to breathe properly. And if you've ever thought about this, there are moments in life when you think, I'm, of course I breathe. And then you have to do something where suddenly they're teaching you about breathing and going, well, I've got that down, I'm still here. Yeah, anybody ever taken scuba diving lessons? Scuba yeah. diving lessons? Yeah. Two phrases that came up all the time. Don't forget to breathe. <clears throat> and breathe normally. Remember, do you remember those? Because here's the problem. You put on this outfit and then you go underwater. What's your body's natural response when suddenly you're underwater? Hold your breath. Hold your breath. Because what's out there surrounding you? Water. And what's that stuff going to do if you suck it in? Bad moment, okay? And here's the problem. You have the means of being under the water safely on your back, hooked up to your face, but people, despite all the training, get underneath and they stop breathing. Or some people think this, you know, I want the tank to last longer, so I'll just take a gasp every now and then. And, and here's the problem. If you're not breathing normally, deep breathing, diaphragm breathing, you always push that, not, not high in the chest, but diaphragm breathing, you're not sucking in enough oxygen and expelling CO2. So here's what happens when you don't use the tank properly. You're underwater, you have a tank of life-giving oxygen on your back, and you pass out because you're not breathing normally. And so they tell you, here's the whole thing, you have to learn to breathe. Here's that illustration and understanding. We are immersed in a world that is completely hostile to us. We are surrounded by things that if we take in are damaging to us spiritually. And God has put in us the situation we have a life-giving capacity to breathe in a hostile environment, to have a life-giving breath of God in our lives, and what do we forget to do? We forget to breathe. The, the Bible puts an illustration. Paul's favorite, he loved to use this, was the runner. Paul liked the running illustration. He even been runners, long-distance runners at some time, sprinters, whatever. There's another thing. The coach always taught us, here's how you breathe. And again, don't breathe high in the chest. Breathe in the diaphragm. You've got to suck in real air. And here's the other thing. You, if you were going to function in a competitive area, your breathing had to improve lung capacity. You had to strengthen that. You had to learn to do this properly. How effective are you if you take a couple of deep gas and then try to run a, run a couple of laps without breathing again? How effective is that going to be? Not your best moment. You also had to train your body to have that capacity to build up lung capacity because in running there's that moment they call hitting the wall. Mm -hmm. Anybody ever hit the wall? Had that mm -hmm. moment? That's that moment when your body goes, I've had enough of this, I'm done. And you're looking and the race says, it ain't over yet. Your body says, oh, yes, it is. <laughs> and there's that point at which you have trained yourself to breathe through that. And some people start that shallow breathing. They, they don't get enough oxygen. And you can push through. You can make your body do things you thought were impossible. We also learned that you had to do it at different altitudes. I, I always liked it in high school when the guys down in the uh, LA area came up here to compete. 2,000 feet makes more difference than you think. 
And suddenly we're going, oh yeah, lap nine, they're about done. <laughs> and you had to come up early. I remember the first time I had to have a fight in Denver, and I remember moving, and I went weeks in advance because I knew I would not make round 15 if I was not completely acclimated to that. Breathing. Breathing is the focus here. God is talking about the most critical thing to spiritual life, prayer. Prayer. So he's telling them, don't forget the critical aspect. I, I remember watching the Karate Kid. I think I always got a kick out of that one. Uh, Mr. Miyagi is taking down the Russo Karate. Remember the whole, you all know, the wax on, the wax off, the right hand, the left hand, and all that stuff. And now we're going to paint a fence, you know, right hand big boards, left hand small boards. And at the end of each of those things, remember what Mr. Miyagi always says? Breathe in, breathe out. Don't forget to breathe, Daniel son. Very important, right? <laughs> always hitting with that. Don't forget to breathe. Jesus is saying, you think you're breathing, and you're not. You're not helping yourself at all in this. So he's telling us a content of prayer, the aspect of breathing that people have never thought of before. And the beginning point, he says, as these first few phrases, we're going to get a third one today on that same theme, is this. The problem with prayer is you start in the wrong place. Where do most of us start with prayer? Me. The I, it's all I pronouns. It's all personal pronouns. And you will notice in the opening of this prayer, each of the category points has nothing to do with you as a starting point. It has to do with God. It has to do with God. That's what your dominant prayer. And I understand why that is hard for us to get through. How do we start life? Every parent, how is that child? What is the focus of their world? It's all about me. And I'm going to let you know when I'm not happy about what's going on around me. And we always look at words. I'll tell you, almost any parent will, will confirm this. We Kids learn words. We're so thrilled when they say daddy and mommy the first time, dad and mama. You know one word they learn real fast and don't no. get rid of easy? No. No. And then there's a second one that I especially love is they learn when they're with friends and they're playing with toys together. And that word is mine. mine. <laughs> oh, that is mine. And it's amazing how much it becomes mine when they didn't care about it three minutes ago until someone else picked it up. And then suddenly that's the most important item in the room. We're supposed to grow out of that. And here's what God is trying to take us to. Here's what Jesus is laying out. We must change that focus. And the opening words then are our Father. Remember our starting point? Our Father. The focus is on the fatherhood of God. The stature of the relationship with God. It's about God. And we found out several things about that. What did you learn about our Father? What were some of the things we picked up in that point? We picked up absolutely it's not nothing. directly Abba Father. One, it's not directly. It's, it still contains a, an authority and a, a, a majesty to it. Yes, there's a familiarity. But notice this. Our Father says something very special. Is he everybody's father? No. No, no he's not. Whose father is he? For believers, there's an adoption process. There's a means by which God becomes our Father. This whole idea of the universal brotherhood of man and fatherhood of God is not in Scripture. It is not found here. It is not taught here. He is our Father. This is the paternity. It is a family relationship. What does that tell you? What is a family relationship? How much does God want to talk to you if he's dad? A lot. He wants to be available. Remember that whole thing. He's our Father in heaven. And we always think of the heaven, how distant he is, but the Our Father brings him where? Right here. Close. Now we have that closeness. This is our Father. A fatherhood that puts him in our right in our place. He is there waiting to talk to us. He wants that relationship. He is not looking for ritual. Dad wants to talk. Is there anything more annoying talking to your child than dismissive and empty words? So how'd your day go? Fine. So what are you doing later? I don't know. Don't you love those conversations? <laughs> no. <laughs> Where just you have no idea what's going on, no sharing, no openness. God wants a complete openness. He wants this to be a family relationship. Next thing we say, our Father in heaven. He's bridged that. We found this now. Hallowed be your name. This continues that family idea. There's a family name. Names are important. Names are attached to things. In some cultures, as we said, 
names were not given until you had earned a reputation of a certain kind. In Native American cultures, a name could change or be amended, or sometimes they held and did not give a name until a person was attached to some activity that defined them. And they came up with a name that said, this is who they are, this is the character we have seen in them. Yeah. There's, there's some things about that. Now keep in mind, that's a two-edged sword. If you've established a pretty bad character and you get a monitor now that you're gonna carry the rest of your days, he who talks back, you know, that's, <laughs> you, you really don't want that one. He who cannot be trusted with my horse. You know, you know, things that you really don't want attached to your name. And these are what goes on here. But a name, it's, an, it's a whole issue of that. Being attached to a name that says something about who you are. A name is a family bond. We, we said that family names were taken from a parent. It was talked about what they did or what they would like. And it became a moniker that identified us. It gave us a sense of belonging to a community. I don't know if you've read this or gone through this, but that sense of family identity is one of the most critical things for positive child development that, that exists. A sense of belonging somewhere. There is a group of people that are always available to me that no matter what, they're my people. I can count on this. There's an identity I draw from that I know is always there. And what is our culture doing with that critical sense of identity? We are just destroying the sense of families. I said for the first time in our history, over half our children are born outside of wedlock. That's why the gangs do so much. And there's you go. Where are they going to go? If they need that and it's not provided where God intended it, what are they going to do? They'll create it someplace else. Now we see in our inner cities, so many of our young men and now women involved heavily in gang activity. You want to wonder why you see so many kids involved in political things that they really don't understand? It's because if there's a sense of family there, belonging. Here's a group of people that accept me and we think the same way and there's that identity. Even if it's a stupid identity, even if it's practicing something that makes no sense, it will draw them in because they've never found a place that says, here is where I belong. This tells me who I am. And so you have this thing going on. It's a huge thing. And we said names matter. Some of you probably spent a lot of time trying to pick a name for a child, trying to figure that out. And we always uh, are changing that. Have you ever followed the changing most popular <laughs> names? Which ones are going on? It's always funny to watch which one. When I was growing up, there were at least five Daves and five Johns in every class I was in. Those were the names for guys. Karen, everybody was Karen. And we had all these names were the most common. They change over time. They change over time. But they've also found this, and this study may bother you a little bit, but they found this, that the name you choose for your child can have an incredible impact on their sense of identity and their success in life. A really bad name, a ridiculous name that means, oh, Despite what Johnny Cash says, you do not name a child a stupid name and expect it to help them in life. Boy named Sue? Yeah, there's the boy named Sue. There's an identity crisis when a name is just, it's a mockery, it's a problem in life. And we certain names have fallen out of favor for generations that America didn't name anybody Benedict. We just didn't do that. Adolf is not a popular name in Germany to this day. It just doesn't come up very often. We have this sense that certain names don't work. I've always wondered what must happen to some of these poor kids that are born to uh, singers and actors. Because you've seen some of the names these people come up with. Okay. There's one. Frank Zappa was a singer when I was growing up. Dweezel and Moon Unit. What? Yes, daughter was Moon Unit Zappa, son was Dweezel. Yeah. Crazy stuff. You just kind of look at this and you wonder. Uh, Gracie Slick, of an old group, Jess and Evelyn, named her son God. God. There's one to live up to. But it's important to have a sense of identity. And in this case, the understanding the name of God. God's name means something. You went through that. You, should, you can get a book on all the names of God found in the Bible. It's an incredible list. And all of them tell you something about who he is, the character of God. And so we focus on this. Hallowed be your name. Understand what the name of God means. Identify with that family name. Live up to 
is the challenge there, that family name. Now that brings us to our next one here. And this is the third one that tells us where the focus is. And here it is, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here's the next thing about the focus that we should have when we're following God. What is it that is our most driving passion in service to God? What is it we should want more than anything else? An open question. What should we want more than anything else if we're truly following God? What he wants. That he get the recognition he deserves. Now I want you to think what that does in our theology. The theme of the Old Testament was there is going to come a Messiah who will rule. Understand, the word Messiah means he has the right to rule. Is a ruler who has the right to rule. What's the focus of the New Testament? What was the promise that drove the church after Jesus ascended? He's coming back as a ruler. There's a point at which Jesus is going to get the recognition, the power, and the authority he did not claim the first time. And the only reason he didn't claim it the first time, it wasn't he came down and men said no and God, oh, I wish we would have worked this out. He came and just gave up his life willingly to claim a people for himself so that when he returns, there will be a people he will rule and not just judge. This is the distinction. We are supposed to be about, we are supposed to be focused on, it is supposed to be our desire that Jesus gets the recognition he deserves, that ruling becomes the position he holds. That is supposed to be what the church is focused on. And I think we really mess that up. Especially the modern church in America right now, I'm a little concerned. I, I want to I preface this by saying this. I am one of the most dietable <coughs> conservative patriotic guys you will ever be. I put my flag out on days most of you wouldn't recognize as days you should remember. I know Pearl Harbor Day, I know D-Day, I, I keep track of these things, they matter to me. I will also tell you this, uh, like some of you perhaps this, I believe the U.S. Constitution is probably the finest document ever drafted by humans, drafted by humans that ever existed. I think it's a work of genius, I truly do. And it concerns me that there is an attempt to dismantle it, to disregard it, and put it aside. I understand it was written by people, but here's what I think with the genius of it was. It was people who understood something. Let me get this. It was not written by a group of Christian men, necessarily. John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Franklin especially, these were not godly, wonderful men. But they were influenced by a godly understanding that said this. One, God's law makes sense, and we will make the basis of U.S. government on this, the rule of law. Law, they said, came right out of Scripture. It is on the Supreme Court building until they can sandblast it off. It tells you that. It's very important. I appreciated this. Do I know that they were flawed, and do I recognize they did not end slavery the day? Yes, I do. Was that evil? Absolutely it was, but I think the genius is this. They looked at it and said, we cannot win that fight right now. But unlike other places, we are going to write into our original founding documents this principle. That what? All men are created equal. created equal. And they said this, I am going to set before this country the desire to be better than it was the year before. And that year, I'm going to demand that they look at themselves and strive to be more than they are. And I think that is a piece of genius. That we are actually the only nation on earth that said we recognize that man is sinful, we recognize he can't be trusted, and we are going to compel ourselves to look and evaluate and strive to be more than we are. That's, in my mind, one of the greatest works of all time, the human concept. I like that. I like that they recognize man can't be trusted. They put checks and balances. The U.S. government is the most inefficient government you'll ever come across, and there's a reason for that. We can't trust people. People do stupid things and they compel them to slow down and to think and to have to go through a process so you just don't get all worked up and the mob goes, we're changing all the laws. Brilliant. All this to say this, I can go on about that in his historian, I, I love that aspect, but a Christian's primary goal is not to protect the Constitution of the United States. It is not to preserve the country of the United States. 
Understand this, nations rise and fall. This one, as much as I hate the thought of it and what it will do to this world, will come down. God doesn't. And our goal is not to fight for a Christian country. I want you to understand this. That's the dumbest thing ever said about the United States. We were never a Christian country. There have been times in our history when there's been a preponderance of Christians that have changed the character of this nation for the better. That's been great. But it has never been a Christian country country. We have been a country affected by Christian laws. But come down to this. Understand our fight is that God get his due. Our goal is not to preserve this, but that Christ would come and establish the kingdom that belongs to him. And this is supposed to be the focus of the believers. Understand how we view this. I this changes something in our theology, and some of you are aware of this. Theologically, there's been a debate that's gone on for some time now about the lordship controversy of where Christ stands. And people will tell you this. There's a time at which you accept Christ as Savior, but you may not be prepared to accept him as Lord. And that's a different choice that you make. He's Savior, but you're not prepared to accept him as Lord. I want you to understand what this phrase says right here. Christ has no other identity except that of Lord. Ruling is the identity of the man. It is his right. You cannot bring him in and make him your genie in a bottle that does what you want him to do. He is ruler. He is going to rule. He wants the right to rule first in your heart, and this is the beginning of the kingdom. The first part of the kingdom is established in you as a people, you get a taste of it, but eventually he's going to rule everything. Notice that phrase, on earth as it already is in heaven. How much of control of heaven do you think Jesus Christ has right now? I think he's probably in charge. I don't think God has said, no, you're going to handle the tennis courts. I've got the rest. <laughs> That's not happening. He is a ruler. He was raised to the right hand. He is the son of David. He was born a king. Ruling is in his DNA, if you will. That's the status he's supposed to have. So as we look at this, understand the focus he's trying to give us. We must recognize that our drive is that Christ be in charge of things. And the first thing is he needs to be in charge of me. That we are subjugating our lives to his rulership. That we are living in that pattern. And that we are waiting for the ultimate point at which he will rule everything which is his due. That's what the church is supposed to be about. I think our difference is most of us really don't like that vision of Jesus Christ. Yes, John? I think you get a unique picture of that. Where you have, you know, sometimes Where were you when I laid yeah. yeah. I didn't need your advice then, and I don't need it's a hard one for us to come terms with. That God is not asking for our vote of approval. Now, if God is not asking for our vote of approval, if it's about his rule, how does that change the content of our prayer? Think about that for a second. See if you how does that change the content of our prayer? It's not that. Prayer then must not be me trying to get God persuaded to my kind of thinking. What's the point of prayer? Change my mind to focus on what God. No prayer offered that is not seeking what God wants is an effective prayer. You understand that? This changes the impact of prayer. The problem with most modern Christianity is we really prefer God as a talk show host on the radio. I put this out because here's what we can do. We can tune him in when we want to. 
and we can listen to him, we can laugh at his jokes, we can really get a lot, we can enjoy some of the insights he has, and we can go through this stuff, and maybe we'll go buy his best-selling book and read a few chapters of that, but when we don't want it anymore, what can we do? We can turn that off. That's not an option here. If we have this view of God, we don't have that option. We have to approach God on his terms. There's an old saying uh, from a commentator on the Talmud. The Jewish writer said this, that prayer in which there is no mention of the kingdom is no prayer at all. Early Jews understood this, that the kingdom was the whole point. But here's something else we need to understand in the setting here. They had messed up the definition of the kingdom. And here's what Jesus is bringing back to. It's not a Jewish kingdom. It's not your kingdom. It's not an American kingdom. Understand what he's saying here. Here's what the Jews wanted. The whole point was God was going to send a Messiah who was going to establish not his kingdom anymore, but a Jewish kingdom that would raise Israel above every nation on earth. This is what they wanted and expected. It's not what they got. And when they didn't get it, how pleased were they with the outcome? So disappointed that they killed the man who offered that kingdom. He's going back to this. It isn't supposed to be your kingdom. It's supposed to be his kingdom. The kingdom, the word, it's just three words here, Basilelia, the word does not refer to a place. It's not an image of castles or drawbridges or crowns or thrones. It literally means a place that is ruled by someone. To rule. And here's another one that's really come. The word erikomai in the Greek is an aorist active imperative, which you all understand and know the meaning of, correct? <laughs> okay. An aorist active imperative. It says this. It is not something that happens gradually. The kingdom is not something that is built brick by brick. Remember the old saying, Rome wasn't built, built, built in a day. Guess what? Jesus' kingdom is. When he comes to rule, as he does in heaven, it comes immediately, it comes right now, and it's done now. When he takes over, the issue is settled. He doesn't have to work. He doesn't have to go through a conquest. I'll have to beat this nation and this nation and get it all. This is not Alexander the Great working his way through and building it. No, he comes, the issue's settled. I want you to understand what this does for theology. There are several different theological, theological views here. Uh, Pre-millennial, ah-millennial. Uh, You've heard these terms perhaps in the past. I'm pre-millennial. A pre-millennial view says this. There is going to come a literal, actual, thousand-year kingdom where Jesus will rule on earth. And it hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened yet. Because here, when it does happen, you can't miss it. Jesus will be in charge. He comes, and it's his, and nobody's going to miss the day. So I, I know in 1914, supposedly, there was a secret return of Jesus Christ, according to Jehovah's Witness, that nobody noticed. I have news for you. There's nothing in this book that suggests that when Jesus comes, people are going to go, what? Yeah. No. That's only, that's because only 144,000 are allowed in. Yeah. The issue is settled. There are some people that teach this. There's a millennial view that says we are currently in the millennial period. Okay? The millennial period is a time in which what happens is we preach and minister and slowly but surely we establish in people's hearts the truth of God and God's kingdom grows and eventually the earth will understand and the earth will respond as it should. Are you seeing that as a progress of history? <laughs> no. Anybody that studies history doesn't seem to make sense. And again, the word says that when it happens, it happens instantly. Instantly. Because it's his kingdom and you're going to know it. And what kind of a kingdom is it going to be? It's going to be one ruled by one person. That is going to be in charge of making all those decisions. Now I know why people get confused on this. Because it's interesting to note that the kingdom is mentioned in three tenses in scripture. Past, present, and future. Why is it on all three tenses if it comes in a moment, at a time, in history, and it's done? Because it affects all past, present, and it affects all past, present, and future. That's absolutely true. All of history is moving to that. But here's the thing that some people are confused by. 
Remember Jesus. John the Baptist declaring the kingdom is at hand. Jesus came to offer the kingdom. Are you kingdom citizens now? Yeah. yeah. Has the full kingdom been established? No. But are you kingdom citizens? Yes. Are you experiencing some aspects of the kingdom and some benefits of the kingdom right now? Yes. Can you look back at a past moment in history when that happened? Yes. Some of you have it written down in your Bible. You know, this day, how you so you do it with your kids. This day they have second Jesus Christ. There is a past aspect to it. There is a present aspect to it. But the future one is what's on page here. When it comes to full and final fruition, this is the kingdom. It's going to come and it's going to be done now. Here's the question that I need to ask and I wonder about this. And I think this is where the church is missing something in its intentions and what it's supposed to be in its identity. Do you think, or do you see, let me ask it, if you, as you observe the modern church, do you see a passion among Christians to see Jesus come back? When you read the pages of scripture, do you see a passion for Jesus to come back? Oh, yeah. Why is there no passion for this? Especially for most of us here in America for generations, life's been pretty good. And Jesus returning would be a little bit of an inconvenience. You know, I don't mind so much if he comes toward the end of my life. I'm 96. You know, I'm not feeling all that well anymore. And some days I don't, I'm not even there enough to know I'm not feeling well anymore. Uh, and I've done the vacations I intended. I completed the career I wanted to be successful at. Uh, my kids have been raised and I've seen them marry and I've had grant and I've enjoyed all the stuff I want to enjoy. Jesus can come now. It's not an inconvenience for me. Now I'm okay with it. Yeah, John? I mean, a lot of that comes from the bad theology in terms of what I view the future with what Christ to be. You know, strum a harp on a cloud or, or something like that. Like, wow, you know, okay, we're going to be singing in a worship choir. Yeah, I'd so rather be in the Bahamas. Side. It doesn't sound that good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and you look at, yeah, life here, especially as Americans, and you know, hey, life's not that bad, you know, and, and I have to give up, you know, a lot of these pleasantries or things that I own, and, and the reality is we don't understand that life will be so beyond our comprehension in terms of, you know, that we serve a good God, and everything will be good beyond what we can conceive, you know, we live in a simple world, our minds are flawed, you know, we cannot even conceive what it will be. I don't think we do see that. We don't see him as a good God, and that's what's tragic, that we don't understand that if God is good and he wants what's good and best for us, then whatever he offers has to be better than this. And I don't think we see it as better. I think most Christians view that God is going to come as an inconvenience. Go, okay, everybody out of the pool, you know, fun time's over. I've got a kingdom to run here. And that's how we view it. Yeah, I think we also don't have a deep enough understanding of how horrible sin is and how much it's permeated every aspect of our lives. Like we totally, truly understood how depraved we are and how horrible that is and truly fought and realized we can't do it, then we would beg even more for him to come. Also true, mankind does not, and Christians are still caught up that mankind thinking that we do not want to come to terms with how bad sin is. And this is what gives you, Christians don't understand the battle in this one. People are very upset, this whole gender identity thing, the gay and lesbian rights movement, all the stuff that's going on. But understand, the biggest issue is not rights. They've been saying it. They want the right to a job. And I don't, do not want to deny any person, regardless of what sin, I don't care if they're a, if they, if they're a fornicator, if they have a right to buy a home, to have a job, to live their life. I don't mind rights. But the issue has never been rights. The issue is that we want to call what they're doing moral. We want to change morality to say there is no such thing as sin. Whatever you are doing is just fine. And that is our culture. We want to redefine sin as moral. And that's where the war is being fought. And that's why now that our Christian truth to read the Bible is hate speech. Because man does not want to come to grips with sin. And tragically, the church is following the same problem. That we do not want to identify sin as sin anywhere where we face it. Yeah, Wendy? Our 
culture has become so divorced from relationships in general. How much time do we spend with almost anybody really investing time anymore? That we talk, that we understand things. The world is done in sound bites and in sections. And like you say, two minutes is an eternity now. That's my attention span. We need to move on. I'm getting bored here. Mariah has a beautiful picture book called The, the Garden, the Curtain, and the Cross. And it keeps saying throughout it, you know, that it is good to be with God. It's a wonderful thing to be with God, but because of sin, you can't be with God. And it repeats that throughout the whole salvation from the garden to the resurrection. And in the end, saying, now we can go to God's wonderful place and be with Him because of the cross. But I don't know that we view that as, oh, I can't be with God. So, you know, the beginning, Eve's like, Adam, God's going to walk with us again. Oh, I bet it's more awesome than it was yesterday. We don't we don't have that sense, I, and we've lost a lot of that. Marriage was supposed to be that relationship that was to be the model of the relationship between Christ, Christ and the church. And I'll tell you, it's driven home for me. I, and I'm not trying to, to wow my wife with this, but I'll tell you, I really cannot conceive of a meaningful life without her in it. That relationship is so central to who I am, to what I do and how I feel about life, that it's really hard for me to conceive of that. And that should be the Christian understanding. That, that relationship with Christ is so central that there is not life without it. And this is what Jesus is trying to drive home. Stop just repeating words. Stop just going through the rote action and get down to this and say, am I having a relationship? Am I talking to a living God who rules in my life and matters to me to the level that says, more than anything else, the happiest moment I can imagine is him returning and being here with me and getting the power he deserves, getting the recognition he deserves, ruling as he deserves. And Christians don't view the relationship like that anymore as a whole. Yes, I think we have a problem with authority as well, mm -hmm. which kind of uh, brings all that into play. Because I don't want anybody telling me what to do. Especially as Americans, again, that's in our DNA, isn't it? That's the whole idea. I mean, my forefathers were kicked out of the civilized countries and came here because we wouldn't do what we were told. That's why we're here. My Scottish ancestors were said, you won't buy the rules, we'll ship you over there and we'll just be done with you. We said, okay. And that's, that's where we live. And this is hard for us to understand. It's hard for the young people that I've witnessed to. So there's too many rules in your religion. And they look at it as... I mean, to submit to authority, and they don't want that. No. And it is hard for us to come to grips with this because authority always means losing what we want. Right. And here, authority means getting everything we really do need. Mm -hmm. And that is a hard concept to get down. But that's the beginning point. <clears throat> the first three focuses. It's about God. And it comes down to that. Our Father. He is our Father. He has given us a name that identifies us and he has a right to rule that should be our great passion in life. And so it begins with a change in focus for the prayer that says, this is about the God who changes my life. Close this up, and if there's any comments or things